is research focusing on investigating lung modulation effects in particle therapy and drug structure simulations of clinical particle beams, both on microscopic and macroscopic scales. And so, uh, if you can prepare your presentation, we can uh, start. I can leave you the floor. Thanks a lot for introducing us, uh, the Marburg Ion Beam Therapy Center. the introduction so you can see my slides yeah perfectly perfect okay so yes so my name is Kilian Baumann I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Philips University of Marburg and a medical physicist at the Marburg Eye Beam Therapy Center and I will give you a brief overview of the Marburg Eye Beam Therapy Center and the physics research that we are performing at our working group so the Marburg Eye Beam Therapy Center is located here in the middle in Germany, so roughly 80 kilometers north from Frankfurt. And the construction of the accelerator started in 2007. And there are two facilities in operation. It's one here in Marburg and one in Shanghai in China. And the construction uh, took about roughly to 2009 and the accelerator itself was installed in 2008. And we had the first beam in our treatment room in 2010 and planned to irradiate the first patient in 2011. However, then due to financial problems, we had to shut down the facility and it was then restarted in 2015 under the leadership of the Heidelberg Iron Therapy Center. And also in 2015, the first patient was treated. And then in 2019 and August, uh, the ownership of the Marburg Arm Therapy Center was then changed back from the Heidelberg Arm uh, Therapy Center to the University Hospital in Gießen and Marburg. And this is the layout of our therapy center. So we have here located the ion sources and the particles. So we have protons up to 250 MeV and carbon ions up to 430 MeV per nucleon. And these particles are then pre accelerated in a linear accelerator and are then led into our synchrotron. And in the synchrotron, we have the acceleration. And after the synchrotron, we have then the high energy beam line that transfers the beam to our treatment rooms. We have all together four treatment rooms. Three treatment rooms have an horizontal beam outlet and one treatment room has then a 45 degree beam line. And here you can see um, a picture of our synchrotron. So here the, the red magnets, uh, these are the dipole magnets that keep the particles on track. And here the yellow magnets are quadrupole magnets that are used for the focusing of the particle beam. Here is a picture of our ion source. So we have two different ion sources, one for the protons and one for the carbon ions. And here you have a picture of our treatment room. So the treatment beam is entering here from the right. And we have then here the patient positioned on a robotic table. So since we have no gantry, um, we have this robotic table that can then position the patient with different relations to the beam in our beam line, so that then uh, we can irradiate the patient from different directions. And we are roughly treating uh, 27 patients per month. So you can see here the statistics with the given fluctuations of patients. And this is the number of patients. So in 2018, we had 250 patients and now in 2021, we have over 300 patients and 40% of our patients are treated with carbon ions and 60% are treated with protons. And roughly two thirds of our patients are uh, receiving the particle therapy as a primary therapy and roughly one third is getting the particle therapy as a boost concept in combination with an irradiation with high energy photons. And the treated tumor entities are of course mainly located in our head. And we have like uh, one quarter is head and neck cancers and 22% are central nervous systems with a malignant um, entity and roughly 18% with central nervous system with spending um, modalities. And of course, we also uh, treat children, so it's, uh, roughly 7%. And the main application of particle therapy for children is the so-called neuroaxis, where we have an irradiation of the complete brain and here the spinal cord of the patient. And of course, the big advantage of proton therapy for this entity is that we can irradiate the spinal cord and the brain with a high dose 
but can spare the normal tissue and especially the organs at risk uh, very good with our proton uh, treatments. And the Marburg Eye Beam Therapy Center is also involved in some clinical trials. So we have two trials um, for treating grade two and three gliomas with a proton versus photon or a monocentric prospective, so only treat versus proton. And we have uh, two studies for the glioblastoma treatment. Here again, in comparison between the carbon ions and photon irradiation and carbon ion with some prospective one on trial. And since 2018, um, at the Marburg Eye Therapy Center, we hosted about 18 scientific projects and different um, scientific groups from all over Germany. And we have experiments for radiobiological um, experiments, the medical physics and particle physics. And we have from our Hessian uh, government, we have an annual grant so that um, the beam time for the experiments groups is then financed via our Hessian uh, government. So coming to the research topics I want to show you, we have uh, one uh, topic we are working on. This is the particle therapy of lung cancer patients. And here we have two major challenges. It's on the one hand, the heterogeneous structure of the lung tissue that is leading to a distortion of our dose distribution. And of course, we have to account for this distortion in the dose calculation for our treatment plans. And the second challenge is the motion of the uh, tumor due to the breathing of the patient. And here we are working on a new concept, the so-called 3D range modulator that enables some fast irradiation so that we can perform the irradiation on the breath hold. And then the motion of the tumor volume is not of interest anymore. The second main topic is the Monte Carlo based dosimetry, both on microscopic and macroscopic scales. On macroscopic scales, we are using the Monte Carlo codes to calculate um, overall response functions and beam quality correction factors. And in the track structure simulations, we are using the Monte Carlo code geo 4 dna um, to really investigate the, the efficiency of the radiation on a cellular scale. And we are working on an optical range verification concept, as this concept is used for the quality assurance so in the clinical routine, we have to verify that the energy of our particle stays constant so that we have always the predicted range of the particles. And in order to, um, to investigate this um, quality assurance, we are using this setup. So the beam is coming from the left and is then penetrating here in a water tank. And we are using a CMOS camera to just um, collect the emitted light. And here you can see the light pattern emitted by a proton beam for different energies of the proton beam. And then, of course, we can clearly calculate or, or determine the range of the break peak in the water tank. And we already compared this, um, this light based methods uh, with well established measurement equipment from the clinic, for example, the PTW break peak chamber. And as you can see, the range verification method is working. And we can uh, detect changes in the energy of uh, smaller than 0.5 mega electron volt. The only open question for this method is where the light originates from, especially in the Bragg peak, because here for a 160 MeV proton beam, we are showing the spectral fluence of electrons that are produced by the proton beam. And especially for, for large depth, so here 12 centimeters where the Bragg peak is located, the energy of the secondary electrons is not sufficiently high to produce Terenkov radiation. So really the light that is emitted here in the Bragg peak is not Terenkov radiation, but some scintillation effects. And we are currently performing measurements to see where this light originates from. For the track structure simulations, so simulations on the cellular scale, we are using the Monte Carlo code uh, geo 4 dna And compared to the standard geo 4 Monte Carlo package, the GeO4DNA Monte Carlo code is able to simulate really the track structures, so each individual interaction of our particles and an energy deposition down to several evolves is possible. And in combination with modeling complete cells or the DNA within the cell nucleus, we can then really investigate where the damage is produced in our cell. And we can then, of course, determine not only the quality, but also the quantity of DNA damages. 
And we are using this Monte Carlo code um, on the one hand for the investigation of the flash effect. So the flash effect is an ultra high dose irradiation where we irradiate um, intensities of over 40 gray per second. And the effect is that the control of the tumor, so the dose deposit in the tumor leads to a destruction of the tumor. But due to this ultra high doses, we have a significantly higher sparing of the normal tissue. Whereas this effect is not totally understood where this originates from. And using our Monte Carlo simulations, we can here, for example, calculate the production of chemical radicals in dependence on the beam intensity. And here you can see Monte Carlo calculated single strand and double strand breaks for various energies of protons. And the overall goal is to use these Monte Carlo simulations for the optimization of um, the, the models describing the radio biological effectiveness. For the macroscopic dosimetry, we are focusing on the typically clinical dosimetry used um, with air filled ionization chambers. So in ionization chambers, we have an air filled cavity and ionizing radiation uh, penetrating this air cavity will create ion electron pairs within the air in the cavity. And when we are applying a voltage, these um, ions and electrons are accelerated towards the cathode and anode. And we can then uh, measure the charge that um, was produced by the radiation. And this measured charge is then directly proportional to the deposited dose. And we can uh, apply different voltages to our ionization chambers and then give uh, have different working routines, so to say. And we are typically working here in the regime between 200 and 400 uh, voltage. Um, where we then have a proportional um, response of our ionization chamber. And in principle, we can then calculate from our measured charge directly the dose that was deposited. So the dose is defined by the energy that is deposited in a mass element dm. And the energy that is deposited is just our measured charge multiplied by the energy that is needed to create an electron ion pair in the air. And the mass of our cavity is the density, so the mass density of the air multiplied by the volume. And then when we have measured the charge, we can directly calculate and dose. However, the main problem is that the volume of this airflow cavity is not known with a sufficiently high accuracy because due to the, to the production process of the ionizing chambers, we have small deviations in this volume and we just don't know the volume accurately enough to really use this formula to calculate the dose. So we have to go a different approach and this different approach is the calibration of our l ionization chambers. So I have shown here two exemplary ionization chambers. This is a cylindrical compact ionization chamber and a plain parallel ionization chamber. And in order to calibrate our ionization chambers, we irradiate them under specific conditions. This is mainly in cobalt-60 gamma radiation. We position our ionization chamber in water at a depth of 10 centimeter and irradiate the ionization chamber with a beam size of 10 times 10 uh, square centimeters. And of course, we have to account for temperature and pressure of the air. And then we irradiate our chambers with a known gray, for example, one gray. And then we can directly from the measurement signal that we have in our ionization chambers, we can then calculate the absorbed dose to water via this calibration factor. And this calibration factor has to be determined for each ionization chamber individually. And in, in, in the clinical routine, we get the ionization chamber together with a calibration file where these um, calibration conditions are noted and where the value of the calibration factor is noted as well. And then this is mostly valid for two years. And then every two years, we just send back our chambers to the, to the manufacturer to get a recalibration of the ionization chamber. And now in our clinical use, we mostly don't use the ionization chamber under these conditions used for the calibration. But um, we generally have different conditions, especially the beam quality. And hence, if we are using the ionization chambers under conditions that are different from the calibration conditions, each of this deviation has to be accounted for. 
So generally, this is the background for our chamber. So when we are not irradiating the chamber, but the chamber is measuring charge, we have to subtract this charge then later from our measurement signal. Then, of course, we have changes in air temperature and pressure that we have to account for. And here the background is that the temperature and the pressure of the air simply influences the number of air molecules. So when the temperature increases, we have a lower pressure and less molecules in our ionization chamber. And hence, we can just not um, produce the same amount of charges when we are irradiating with the same dose. So we have to account for this air temperature and pressure. And then, of course, we have to account for different responses of our chambers to different beam qualities. So here, the beam quality correction factor is applied that then corrects for the different response of the ionization chamber. And then we can use this formula to get our absorbed dose to water from our measurement signal. Just we have to subtract the, the background for our measurement. Then we have to uh, multiply with the calibration factor. And then we have to apply these various um, correction factors. So next to the correction, for example, for air temperature and pressure, we can correct for a different applied voltage. If we apply a different voltage, we can correct for saturation effects or the humidity or the effective point of measurement. And of course, and that is a correction factor we focus on in our working group, the beam quality correction factor that then accounts for the different response of the chamber. And in general, our ionization chamber is calibrated with a calibration beam quality Q0. And at our clinic, we are typically using a different beam quality. Namely, for us, it's proton and carbon ions with different energies. And this um, different response of the chamber, so the beam quality correction factor, should be determined for each ionization chamber individually, and especially for each beam quality that we are employing in our clinic. And the question here is, of course, how can we determine this beam quality correction factor? And the first option is with a measurement-based determination. So in this case, um, one can use the water calorimetry. And in water calorimetry, we measure the dose that is deposited by an increase of the water temperature. So when we're applying a, a dose of roughly one gray, then the temperature in the water will increase by roughly one millikelvin. And that temperature increase can be measured. And then we measure the same field with our ionization chamber. And then by comparing the measurement in our calibration beam quality and our user beam quality, we can then derive our beam quality correction factor. The problem, however, is that this calorimetry has a very high experimental effort and especially it's not convenient for the clinical routine. So we have to fall back on a second option. And the second option is the theoretical calculation of beam quality correction factors. Here also from basic quantities, like for example, the stopping power ratio, water to air, or the correction for fluids perturbation, and again, the energy that is needed to create an electron ion pair in air. And using this formula, um, theoretically calculated KQ factors can then be determined for various ionization chamber models. And these are then tabulated in so-called dosimetry protocols. For example, here in Europe, we are mainly using um, the IAEA TRS-398 code of practice. And then for various proton energies, these KQ factors are then tabulated in the dosimetry protocol. And in the clinical routine, I can just take the KQ factors that are calculated and tabulated in this code of practice. And a third option, and this is the option that we are using at our working group, is then the calculation of the beam quality correction factors with the Monte Carlo method. And for the Monte Carlo method, we have first to simulate or calculate for a specific beam quality the absorbed dose to water in a reference volume. So here we have a reference volume placed in water. It's just a simple disk with a height of 0.25 millimeters and a diameter of 10 millimeters. And then subsequently, we will then model the ionization chamber geometry in our Monte Carlo code. And then we calculate for the same um, beam quality. We then calculate the dose that is deposited in the air cavity of our ionization chamber. So here for a plane parallel ionization chamber and a cylindrical ionization chamber. And then we can then calculate from the absorbed dose to water, 
and the dose that was deposited in our chamber, we can then calculate um, the overall response of our chamber. This is the so-called FQ factor, and it's just the absorbed dose to water divided by the dose that is deposited in our detector. And then, of course, we have to calculate this FQ factor both for the calibration beam quality, so cobalt 60 radiation, and for our used beam quality, for example, protons of a specific energy. And then from the FQ factors for the different beam qualities, we can then derive our beam quality correction factor KQ. And in the case of various photon beam qualities, so high energy photons for different uh, spectra of photons, we have a large variety of both experimentally determined factors as well as Monte Carlo calculated factors. And this is a summary of uh, the experimental values here shown in various uh, symbols. And we have in the dotted line, we have Monte Carlo calculated factors. Here in the straight line, we have the factors tabulated in the TRS-398 code of practice. And the good news is that all of these factors determined differently. So Monte Carlo calculated, experimentally determined, or the theoretical calculation, we have an agreement on the 1% level. The problems for protons and carbon ions, however, is that data are very scarce. So we have not that amount of data. We have only little data. And hence, the concept is that the TRS-398 code of practice is currently being updated. And for the update of this code of practice, um, several experimentally, as well as Monte Carlo calculated, KQ factors were created and included in this um, code of practice. And for the Monte Carlo calculated KQ factors, the Monte Carlo codes PEN-H, Fluker, and GM4 were used. And the values created with PEN-H uh, were performed by Carlos Goma from the hospital clinic in Barcelona. And the Fluker and GM4 values uh, were produced at our working group. And always when we are applying Monte Carlo codes for calculations in medical physics, we always have to firstly optimize the codes. So here are two examples are shown. On the one hand, the influence of the production cut on the calculation of an FQ factor. And this production cut defines how high the energy of an electron must be that is being produced by a proton via the Coulomb interaction so that this electron will really be transported. And in the case that the electron has an energy lower than the production cut, this electron will not be produced, but its energy will just be deposited locally. So the advantage is that the higher the production cut, the faster our calculation will be performed because we have not that much electrons we have to transport. But on the other hand, you can see that the, the choice of the production cut has clearly an influence on the calculation of the FQ factor. So to get a reasonable value for the FQ factors, you have to, to see that your production cut is sufficiently low. And here, for example, a value for a typical production cut is uh, 10 kilo electron and volt for electrons. And all electrons with an energy lower than 10 uh, keV will not be produced, but the energy will be located locally. And all uh, electrons with an energy higher than 10 keV will be produced and simulated. And here, a second example is shown. This is the influence of a condensed history step length. So the condensed history approach is an approach typically used in Monte Carlo simulations. We do not simulate each and every interaction on its own, but we generally combine several interactions to a condensed history step and then apply a multiple scattering algorithm. And the length of this condensed history steps can be uh, defined by the user. And you can see here, if the condensed history step is too large, then the values are not reasonable. So again, here you have to optimize your Monte Carlo code to get reasonable results. And here are shown some experimentally as uh, some exemplary FQ factors for various uh, ionization chambers calculated with the different Monte Carlo codes. So we have PEN-H, Fluker, and GM4. And the one thing that you can see is that the different Monte Carlo codes agree pretty well, so on the 1% level, for low energies for protons. But for higher energies of protons, you can see that the differences are greater, so the differences increases, 
and we have differences of up to 2% for high energies. And the most probably um, background or the most probably reason for this divergence are nuclear interactions, which I will discuss later on in this presentation. And in general, we can see that Fluker leads to the smallest value and PenH leads to the largest value, whereas the Gino4 values are in between the two other curves. And from all of these Monte Carlo calculated FQ factors, we can then determine average Monte Carlo calculated FQ factors, so shown here in black. And a good result is that these average Monte Carlo calculated FQ factors are constant over energy within 1%. But of course, since the Monte Carlo codes increase, the difference increase with an increasing energy, the overall uncertainty of average Monte Carlo calculated FQ factors increases as well. And here you can see the overall uncertainty of all of our ionization chambers that we investigated. And you can see here for low energies, we have a quite low overall uncertainty in the order of 0.3%. But then for higher energy, the overall uncertainty increases with up to 1%. And from these average FQ factors of ionization chambers, we can then calculate the KQ, so the beam quality correction factor. And here in black, we have the Monte Carlo calculated KQ factors. And in green, we have the value from the TRS398 code of practice. And on the one hand, you can see that the agreement or that the Monte Carlo calculated KQ factors agree with the TRS-398 values within one standard uncertainty. But on the other hand, the Monte Carlo calculated factors are always smaller than the values from the TRS-398. And the uncertainties of the Monte Carlo calculated uh, factors are smaller than the uncertainties from the TRS-398. So the potential role of nuclear interactions we have investigated um, the irradiation of a complete ionization chamber here, on the one hand, with a consideration of nuclear interactions, and then without a consideration of nuclear interactions. And we have two main results. The one result is that the nuclear interactions roughly have an, an fraction of 10% to the total dose. So 10% of the dose that is deposited in an ionization chamber is due to nuclear interactions. And this is mainly secondary protons and electrons that are generated by these secondary protons. And then fragments, especially alpha particles, that are produced in the chamber wall and then are scattered inside the chamber and then enhance the dose. And the second is that, of course, when we're deactivating nuclear interactions, that we have roughly 10% less dose. And this creation of alpha particles due to the chamber wall is shown here. So we have, for different chambers, we have different thicknesses of the graphite in the chamber wall. And on the one hand, with an increasing thickness of the chamber wall, we have an increasing fraction of the dose deposited by alpha particles. And with an increasing energy, we have a higher fraction. So both with an increasing thickness of the wall, as well as an increasing energy of the protons, we have a higher fraction of the dose deposited by alpha particles. And here up to 1.5% are deposited by this alpha particles. And this just demonstrates that the role of nuclear interactions plays an important key here in the calculation of FQ factors. So in conclusion for the macroscopic dosimetry, these Monte Carlo calculations are a very efficient tool for dosimetry calculation. However, before we can employ these Monte Carlo codes, we always have to optimize the transport parameters and the physics models so that we really achieve reasonable results with our Monte Carlo codes. And when comparing the different Monte Carlo codes, we can see that they have a very good agreement for low energies, but for higher energies where these nuclear interactions play a major role, we have then differences of up to 2%. Okay, then coming to a an, an more applied uh, science uh, factor of our working group is the particle therapy of thoracic tumors. So the clinical rationale why we want to treat lung tumors with particles is shown here. When we are irradiating lung tumors with photons, we have, in order to, to deposit a high dose in the target region, we always have a considerable dose here in the normal tissue, especially in the normal lung tissue, 
but also in organs at risk like the heart or the spinal cord. When we are looking at the irradiation here as uh, carbon ions, we see that we can also deposit a very high dose to the target volume, so we can also destroy and control the tumor, but we have a significantly better sparing of surrounding healthy tissue and especially organs at risk. So the particle therapy is a very promising alternative for the treatment of lung cancer, but we have two major challenges. The one challenge is the motion of the tumor due to the breathing of the patient. And this can then lead to an underdosage of our target volume. And here we are working on the concept of a so-called 3D range modulator. And with this 3D range modulator, we can enable an ultra fast irradiation and then an irradiation under breath hold is possible. The second challenge is the structure of the lung tissue that leads to a distortion of the dose distribution. And here we have developed a treatment planning system that is able to account for these effects and to minimize those uncertainties due to the lung modulation. And the background of this lung modulation effects is that our lung tissue is very heterogeneous. Uh, these are uh, structure sizes in the order of some 100 micrometers. And we have here the air-filled alveole, and then we have here with a higher density, the uh, solid structure of the lung tissue. And particles traversing this tissue will experience different compositions of the high density material and the air, and hence will experience different energy losses and will have different ranges in the patient. And the effect on the tumor radiation is here shown exemplary. We have in the purple, we have a dose distribution when irradiating through homogeneous materials where we do not have this uh, variable ranges. And in green, we have the same dose distribution after traversing the lung tissue. And as you can see, we have a high underdosage here at the distal end of our tumor. And this underdosage is also very good visible here in the dose volume histogram. The problem, however, now is that this heterogeneous lung tissue is not depicted and not resolved in clinical CT images, but in a clinical CT image, the lung looks more like this. So we do not have the geometrical information of this lung structure. And due to the missing information, our CT images thinks that we have a homogeneous um, tissue and hence the prediction will be more here like the purple dose distribution but in the patient then we will have the green dose distribution and hence an underdosage. And to describe this degradation of the break peak, you can use a simple mathematical model. So starting from an unperturbed reference curve, we can calculate or estimate the dose distribution downstream from this lung tissue by convolving the reference distribution with a normal distribution. And this normal distribution is just a probability distribution that gives us a probability how much material a particle will see when traversing the lung tissue. And from this normal tissue and normal distribution, we can then calculate the so-called modulation power. And this modulation power is a material characteristics that, that describes um, the, the strengths of the broadening of our break peak. And this modulation power can, for example, be measured with ex vivo porcine lung tissue in the beam line, so we just insert the lung tissue in our particle beam and then measure death dose distributions and can then derive the modulation power. The problem is that the structure of the lung tissue in porcine lungs could be different than the structure of the human lung tissue. So the applicability of the modulation power measured with porcine lung tissue is questionable. And hence we derived a second method. And this method is based on the clinical CT image. And in the CT image, we just look at the voxels within our lung tissue. And then when we are performing a histogram analysis, we can derive the modulation power from the width of this histogram. And when you are then using a calibration for your CT scanner, you can then determine based on these clinical CT images, the modulation power for each patient individually. And using this concept of modulation power, we then derived an, an approach to reproduce these lung modulation effects on clinical CT images. And in the patient, we have this binary density distribution. So either the lung structure or the air. 
but we have a very heterogeneous fine structure that is not depicted in our CT images. But in the CT image, we have a quite rougher structure, the CT voxel itself with an edge length between one or two millimeters. And to reproduce these effects, we just modulate the mass density of our CT voxels. And then due to the modulated mass densities, we reproduce the variable ranges of the particles and hence the degraded break peak. And using this approach, we investigated the effect of the lung modulation on the dose distribution of clinical treatment plans of lung cancer patients. And the first result is that this lung modulation leads to an underdosage of the target volume as we expected. So here in white, we have the target volume. In purple, we have the high dose region predicted by our treatment planning system that does not account for these lung modulation effects. And in green, we then have the actual region of the high dose in the patient. And as you can see, due to this lung modulation effect, this high dose region is significantly smaller than predicted by our treatment planning system. And the same effect, but the other way around can be seen for the low dose region. And here, due to the lung modulation effect, the low dose region reaches farther into the tissue than predicted by the treatment planning system and could potentially increase the dose deposited to read, uh, organs at risk. And the underdosage in terms of the average dose and the clinical target volume is luckily quite moderate. So we have underdosages between two and 5%. Uh, however, this is only for protons, but for carbon ions, we have um, significantly more pronounced effects. And to minimize these dose uncertainties due to the lung modulation effects, we modify the treatment planning system. And in this modified treatment planning system, we recover the degradation effects by just using broader base data. So the death dose distribution that are used for the dose calculation in our treatment planning system are degraded. And when we are calculating the dose distribution with these degraded dose, death dose base data, we can then really optimize with considering these lung modulation effects. And when we are applying this treatment planning modality, we can almost fully recover the dose that is deposited to our uh, target volume. And using this uh, modified treatment planning module, we are able to reduce the dose uncertainties due to the lung modulation effects to under 0.5%. And the, the project we are currently working on with these lung modulation effects is that the lung modulation effects not only have an influence on the physical dose distribution, but also on the biological dose. So here you can see the spectral fluence of the primary carbon ions for different depths in water when irradiating an homogeneous tissue. And here, the same spectrum when we are irradiating to lung tissue. And as you can see, the spectrum of these uh, primary carbon ions is degraded and also broadened. So we have a different spectrum. And due to this different spectrum, we also have a different biological effectiveness. And this is shown here, for example. So we have in black um, the relative biological effectiveness of carbon ions as a function of the depth in water. And here in black, when irradiating in homogeneous material, and here in green, when irradiating lung tissue. And of course, we have fear and degradation also in the relative biological effectiveness that should be accounted for in the treatment planning process. Now coming to the second uh, challenge when treating lung tumors with particles, this is the motion of the tumor due to the breathing of the patient. And especially when we are applying our beam with the active scanning method, we have an interference between the motion of the beam and the motion of the target. And as a result, we get a quite inhomogeneous dose coverage in our target volume. Because on the one hand, the beam is moving to, to raster scan our tumor volume, and the tumor volume is moving due to the breathing of the patient. And as a result, we then have this inhomogeneous dose distribution with so-called hotspots. So here, the dose is too high. And here in the middle, we have cold spots. Here, the dose is too low. And this very inhomogeneous dose distribution, this negatively influenced the therapy outcome. 
And the question now is, is it possible to sufficiently reduce the irradiation time so that when we can enable an irradiation under breath hold? And for that, we in the first step must understand why we do have these large irradiation times with our active scanning method. And here, this shows the application of a beam with the active scanning method. So our tumor is divided into slices and each slide is reached with a specific energy of our particles. And then when the energy is selected, we reach a specific slide. And then this slide is uh, covered with dose by scanning the beam over our target wall. And the problem is for carbon ions, we always have to use a synchrotron and the acceleration of each specific energy in a synchrotron needs roughly two seconds. And so the complete irradiation time here shown for an exemplary irradiation plan with 16 ISO energy layers. And you can see we need uh, roughly 80 seconds to irradiate all these ISO energy layers. And the main time that is consumed for the irradiation is the spill pause. So the pause between two spills where we have to accelerate the new energy for the irradiation of the next slice in our tumor. So to solve this problem, we just need a beam device that enlarges our break peak to create and spread our break peak from one single proton energy or carbon ion energy so that we do not need to accelerate different energies but can use only one energy to irradiate the complete tumor volume. And the solution is um, to use a passive range modulator. And this range modulator is similar to a ripple filter and just enlarges our break peak. And the concept is that the range modulator consists of these pin-like structures and particles traversing this range modulator at different positions will experience different amount of material when traversing this range modulator. And with different amounts of material, we again will have different energy losses and variable ranges. And so by inserting this range modulator in our beam line, we can produce and spread our break peak from one single monoenergetic beam. And by adapting the length of each pin, we can directly influence the length of our spread out break peak. And so with this concept, we really need only one single energy to irradiate and complete spread out break peak. And by applying different pins at different positions, we can in general create any dose distribution that we want to have. And here you can see we have just one energy of particles and we just have to irradiate the tumor in the two dimensions with this really fast. And with this single energy, we can then here irradiate the complete tumor volume. And the approach of then to optimize the design of the range modulator using, for example, Monte Carlo calculations. And then the range modulator is, for example, 3D printed using plastic and can then be uh, evaluated with beam experiments. So here on the left side, we have the corresponding simulation for the optimization of our range, simulate, uh, range modulator. And here on the right side, we have then the actually measured dose distribution in water. And you can see we have a very good agreement between the prediction from our Monte Carlo based optimization of the design of the range modulator with the actual dose distribution that we have then measured. And of course, we can then use this concept of the range modulator to um, irradiate complex tumor geometries. And here we have for a specific beam that we want to apply to irradiate the lung tumor, we have to specifically design or extract in the first step the shape of our tumor volume to really see what volume we want to irradiate. And then from the shape of the tumor volume, we can then optimize the design of our range modulator. And this range modulator is then subsequently 3D printed and can be used for the irradiation of the tumor volume. And yes, here again- Sorry for interrupting. Yes. Five minutes left. Yes, that's okay. It's my- Thanks a lot. Last slide. No, one slide will come. Okay. Um, and here again, we have um, the dose distribution that is predicted by our Monte Carlo-based optimization tool. And here you can see the actual dose distribution that we have then measured with this range modulator that was optimized for this shape of the tumor. 
And the, the result or the effect of the irradiation time is shown here. So as I showed in the beginning for this exemplary treatment time, uh, plan with uh, 16 ISO energy layers, we had an uh, irradiation time of roughly 80 seconds due to this spill pulse where we have to accelerate the next energy of uh, particles. And here in blue, you can see the needed irradiation time for the same treatment plan. And as you can see, we can reduce the treatment time to below five seconds. And now to compare with the standard pencil beam scanning. So in the pencil beam scanning, we have a very good dose conformity. So we have a high dose in our target volume and a low dose in the surrounding healthy tissue. And using the 3D range modulator, we can achieve comparable dose distribution. So we have also a high dose to the tumor and a low dose to the surrounding healthy tissue. But for the pencil beam scanning, due to the slow energy switching here in the spill pauses, we have this long irradiation time and the movement of the patient and the residual interplay effects due to the moving target. But with the 3D range modulator, we only need one energy, so the treatment is very fast, and we can now treat the patient under breath hold, and this will effectively eliminate these motion artifacts. And in further um, application of the rain shifter is flash irradiations. As I said, with the flash irradiation, we want to have really high doses in a short time, so roughly uh, 40 gray in a second. And with a synchrotron based facility with the slow energy selection, we can never apply such high doses in a very short time. So here we really need this range modulator to decrease the iteration time to make it possible to apply these high doses in a very short time. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I am happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot, Kilian, for the very nice and interesting talk. And I'm pretty sure that our students will arise very soon some questions. Please uh, don't be shy. Okay, Andreas has a question for you. Yes, Kilian. I hope you can hear me. Well. Yes, I can yeah, hear you. Perfectly. Great. Uh, I have a question about your Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, what kind of beam are you using for these simulations? Is this just a monoenergetic beam or is this uh, some measured phase space? So you mean for the for the calculation of the beam quality correction yes. factors? Yes. Yes. This is just monoenergetic uh, monoenergetic protons with a ten times uh, ten squared centimeter field. Okay. Because um, the the so generally when you're using this active scanning technique, you're applying monoenergetic particles, mm -hmm. and so it's it's reasonable to calculate in a first step the beam quality correction factors for monoenergetic uh, protons and carbon ions. But we are currently working on the calculation or determination of KQ factors in modulated beams. So, for example, in a spread out break peak. Mm -hmm. And here, first uh, results show that you have within 1%, you have a dependence on the position in the uh, spread out break peak because the, the spectral fluence of the energy of the particles is different at different positions in the spread out break peak. And you have a slight dependence on energy. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so our next question is from Philippa. Yeah, hi, can you listen? Yes. Okay, uh, Okay. so first, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. But I wanted to ask something regarding this last part that you mentioned, because when we use the filter, the filters, from what I understand, we can better modulate or at least the distal edge, or I mean, we are, we are best modulating the distal edge of the tumor, uh, whereas in comparison with pencil beam scanning, we can actually modulate both edges, so the distal and the proximal one. Yes, so yep. that, uh, yeah, so that part, and also the additional part of if we are just using the higher energy, then if we are considering carbon ions, then if we have the higher energy, we'll also have more fragmentation uh, tile effects. So I want all this to say that I wanted to ask that all these considered, if it's still better to, to use these filters instead of scanning, because then you also have these other two downside effects, if I'm understanding correctly. Yes, so you're right, you have, um, so the, the advantage against, or the advantage 
compared to the passive scattering is that we can modulate both the distal and proximal edge of our target volume. A bit disadvantage compared to, to the active scanning is that on the one hand, due to the range modulator, we have a higher neutron flux because due to the material in, in the beam line. And we are currently investigating different uh, 3D printing materials in order to get the, the smallest uh, production of neutrons. And in, in respect, for example, to the lateral scattering of particles due to the range modulator, we are working on a concept to place the range modulator as near as possible to the patient so that the scattering has not that, that high influence. Um, but you're right, the, the disadvantage that we have to irradiate with the high carbon ion therapy uh, energy of the carbon ions and hence if this uh, have this large fragmentation, this is an effect that we cannot eliminate. But on the other hand, the, the advantage compared to the pencil beam scanning that we have in, in short irradiation, so de facto no motion artifacts. And also on a, from a clinical point of view, the irradiation of a patient is then faster compared, for example, to using a gating technique and it's more robust. So I think this advantage will ultimately um, count here. So to be clear, we are not currently uh, irradiating patients with the range modulator. Um, we have now started the collaboration with an industrial partner that will then help us to transform this concept in a clinical uh, trial. Okay, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. We can move on to Habiba's question. Yes, uh, hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. I had a clinical question. Um, would treating a patient this way with a, a range modulator or with PBS have the same impact if the patient has a tumor shrinkage or not? I mean, would a tumor shrinkage have the same consequence on the treatment uh, if you were using a PBS or range modulator? I'm not quite sure if I understand the, the question correctly, <laughs> but you mean it's to, in terms of an adaptive radiotherapy? Yes, that, exactly. And you have a shrinkage that you adapt your, your treatment plan to account for the shrinkage of the tumor volume. That would mean that we then have to design a new range modulator to account for this smaller tumor volume. Okay, and, and this is, of course, a higher effort compared to a pencil beam scanning where you only have to, to re-optimize the treatment plan. Yeah, that's, that was actually my follow-up question, if I can ask it, as, yeah. um, in terms of workflow, if you have to re-scan a patient, uh, I mean, is this strategy a good one for, um, a good one or not? I don't know if I'm actually clear. So in fact, the, the, the re-scanning technique is potentially used to, to decrease the interplay effects due to the motion. Okay. So that you just rescan because the, um, the interference between the tumor motion and the motion of the beam is, is solely statistical. And by rescanning, you can, so to say, have lower fluctuations in the, in the inhomogeneous dose distribution. And there are several studies that show, for example, when your irradiation deliver, that you can clearly reduce these interplay effects when you're using the rescanning technique. Um, but for the irradiation with the range modulator, we would not need a rescanning technique because we do not have to, to reduce interplay effects because we can eliminate, so to say, at least for the lung tumor, um, the motion completely because we are then irradiating under breath hold. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We can move on to Florian. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for this talk. It was really interesting. I would have a question about also this uh, range modulator. Uh, what precision for this modulator do you really need to really get a, an, a correct dose distribution afterwards? So are we talking about the structures in a millimeter or submillimeter regime or how exact does this uh, pin configuration has to be and what can you achieve yes. also with the 3D printer? That's a very good question. So um, the, the, the dimensions of the pin itself are that they are laterally 1 or 1.5 millimeters broad. And the, the length of the pin depends on how large the tumors that we want to irradiate. And the precision of 3D printing itself must be in the micrometer regime. 
because those are the main problems that we saw with our prototypes is that the, the tip of the pin is not printed correctly. Mm -hmm. And when the tip is, is, so to say, cut off, then the, the shape uh, of our spread or break pick, especially at the proximal end, will get wrong. Um, and the second um, effect that we saw is that sometimes the printing material slides down the pins in the valleys between the pins. And then we have too much material and then the distal end of our spread or break peak um, will have the wrong shape. And this is why we are currently testing different materials for printing and different um, techniques for the 3D printing to get the most reliable printing technique. And this is of course one of the reasons why we always would have to have an and patient specific quality assurance for the range modulator to really be sure that the, the design and the shape of the range modulator is correct. And we also saw effects that when the, the range modulators, um, the, when we have several fractions, you have to, to put down the range modulator anywhere. And for example, when it's getting hot, so higher uh, than 40 degrees Celsius, then it can be that the shape of the pin uh, will be destroyed. So it's also the handling of the range modulator. Um, you have to be very careful. All right, thank you. Okay, so the next question is from Maria Chiara. Uh, we seem to not hear you. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, maybe uh, you already answered to, the, to this question, but uh, I uh, would like to know if there was an uncertainties in uh, lung tumor uh, treatment planning can be addressed mainly to the motion or to the lung uh, modulation effect, or if, I mean, if they are more or less the same. Uh, so the dose uncertainties due to the, to the motion of the lung tumors are larger in general. Mm. And um, they are, not systematically. So the, the lung modulation effects are always those uncertainties on the under dosage at the distal end of our spread or break peak. And with a very easy approach, you can account for these dose uncertainties by just enlarging your planning target volume at the distal end. So you, when you see that the lung modulation effects have an, an range uncertainty, for example, for, of, of three millimeters, then you can just enlarge your planning target volume distally and then you can easily account for these lung modulation effects because they are systematically. The motion artifacts are statistically, so you cannot such easily account for these. And also spoken in terms of the absolute dose uncertainty, the motion artifacts are generally larger, but it's always very patient specific. So for yeah. example, the, the lung modulation effects are, are highest for small tumors that are located very deep in the lung. Mm -hmm. And motion artifacts also very clearly depend on the position in your lung, um, whether you have a motion amplitude of some centimeters or only a few millimeters. So it's very, very patient specific, these artifacts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Guess I don't see any more questions, nor in chat, nor in Slack. So 